Good afternoon. Um, it's good to have all of you with us today. Um, I'm Dani Carrillo. I'm a PhD student at the Department of Sociology here at Berkeley, and I'm also a second year fellow in the Graduate Fellows Program. So as second year fellows in the program, we are thrilled to have Professor Herrera here with us today um, and to have had the opportunity to organize this event. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Graduate Fellows Program, it's a program run through ISSI that has offered training and mentorship um, to interdisciplinary cohorts of graduate students um, from diverse backgrounds who are writing dissertations on social change. I can attest to how transformative and empowering the program has been for me, in large part to the amazing guidance of Deborah Lustig, David Minkus, and Christine Trost. So thank you. Every year, the second year fellows invite, invite social justice-oriented scholars to come share their work here at UC Berkeley. And this year, we are honored to have Professor Juan Herrera launch the speaker series this spring. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors for the event, the, the Center for Research on Social Change, Center for Ethnographic Research, Department of Ethnic Studies, Institute of Urban and Regional Development, and Center for Latino Policy Research. We'd also like to take this opportunity to announce an upcoming event here at ISSI. Jennifer M. Randalls, who is Assistant Professor in the Department of Sociology at California State University, Fresno, and a former ISSI graduate fellow, will give a talk on learning and legislating love, family inequality, and U.S. marriage education policy. Her talk will be on Friday, April 28th, from 12 to 1.30 p.m. here in the Woldowski Conference Room at ISSI. We ask that you please turn off your cell phones for the duration of this talk. And um, for this event, Professor Herrera will speak for about 40 minutes. And unfortunately, our respondent was not able to make it today, um, but this leaves more room for Q&A. And we also have the pleasure of having three Chicana Chicana uh, activists here with us, and so maybe they can share some of their thoughts as well. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Juan Herrera, who is Assistant Professor of Ethnic Studies at Oregon State University. He holds a PhD in Comparative Ethnic Studies from UC Berkeley, where he was also an ISSI graduate fellow. From 2013 to 2015, he was a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow in the Department of Chicana Chicano Studies at UCLA. He specializes in the fields of Latino migration, comparative race and ethnicity, and urban studies. He is currently working on a book <coughs> manuscript entitled Care is Political, The State, Philanthropy, and the Making of Latino Nonprofits which traces the historical transformation of grassroots 1960s organizing into institutionalized agencies. His work can be found in Du Bois Review, Latino Studies, and Social Justice. The title for today's talk is Geographies of Activism, Cartographic Memory, and Community Practices of Care. Please join me in welcoming Juan Herrera. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Danny, for a beautiful introduction. And I really appreciate everyone being here. It is just an immense honor to be back at ISSI. Um, it used to be ISSC when I was here, but um, I will call it ISSI. Um, but it was just, I think it was a turning point in my graduate career here. Um, and I really am indebted to the program. And I love um, the family that it's given me and I still stay in contact with the graduate fellows that were in my cohort and other cohorts so um, it's been a real blessing so thank you and it's so great to be with you all and I want to acknowledge that um, two of the people that are featured in my presentation today um, Annette Oropesa and Regina Chavarin um, as well as another Chicano movement activist um, uh, Irene Lopez Perez is also here with us today and hopefully they will share some of their thoughts on the presentation as well as some of the work that they're doing. Um, so thank you all for being here. Um, um, at, for today, um, the, our time together, I'm going to first talk to you briefly a little bit about my book project and then um, launch into a, a discussion, um, my research presentation entitled Geographies of Activism. Um, so the thinking behind today's talk stems from my commitment to engage research practices that privilege long-term collaborative work with community institutions. My book, um, entitled Care is Political, The State Philanthropy and the Making of Latino Nonprofits, draws from over a decade of working with organizations in the Latino neighborhood of Oakland called Fruitville. 
Here I learned how Latino nonprofit organizations care for this neighborhood by providing critical social services, politicizing residents, and bringing resources to the community. And here's a map that, um, where's the map? There it is. Um, so this is what I, a map I took from Street Level Health Project, and it, um, it's a mapping that they did of the resources in the community. And so if you see, this is Fruitville here, and you, should, you can see the sheer density of the different organizations that exist for community members. And so this is Fruitville in relationship to downtown Oakland and other areas um, around it. Um, and so this is also Fruitville a Avenue and International Boulevard, an intersection that is going to figure in profoundly in the presentation, and you'll see. Um, so despite the sheer density of these organizations that, are, um, uh, that, that exist in the region, um, there's, there's really little work done on why there are so many organizations um, in this region. At best, the Bay Area acknowledges that Fruitville has a vibrant civil society and a nonprofit sector that provides services for the Latino community. But none of these descriptions really capture the dynamics that I was, um, that, that I was observing during my field work, which for me set up an intellectual puzzle of piecing together how and why these organizations came to be. My book project um, uncovers the history of how the Chicano movement forged a broad base of support in Fruitville. Chicano movement activists experimented with the creation of community-based organizations that enlisted residents in projects of neighborhood improvement. Grassroots activists created institutions such as Clinica de la Raza, a health clinic, the Spanish-speaking Citizens Foundation, a community resource center, Centro de la, de la Raza, a legal clinic, and the Unity Council, a community development corporation which all still exist today. These organizations are central to the economic, social, and political fabric of the community. The book underscores how in their recollections of the past, Chicano movement activists constructed a politics of activism, race, and social movement struggle forged through productions of space. I contend that an examination of the Chicano movement production of space provides a window into an analysis of social movement continuity. Though moments of street protest that define the movement are now a thing of the past, the institutions that activists built and the new opportunities and resources they created continue to shape the neighborhood. A focus on the production of space also helps us to create a more robust analysis that departs from masculinist portrayals of the Chicano movement. Instead of privileging the moments, uh, the most visible leaders, which tended to be men, my focus on neighborhood level, level institution building helps me to reveal the instrumental role that women played in projects of community improvement. On another register, I analyze the creation of Latino tax-exempt organizations throughout the United States. Now, these institutions share a 501c3 nonprofit status, or tax-exempt status, which requires recognition from and yearly reporting to the federal government. So again, I think this is a major key, the, 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 the requisite of federal recognition, right, and, 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 and subsequent regulation, which requires um, th this recognition. And furthermore, these organizations must rely on an entrepreneurial management of state and philanthropic grants, a process that requires increasing professionalization of nonprofit staff. So instead of seeing nonprofits as, as mere apolitical service provision agencies, I underscore how they represent a contradictory site of both the liberatory possibilities of social movement activism and the consequences of state and philanthropic regulation. The book analyzes how state officials courted 1960s activists and crafted the architecture of Latino nonprofits that channeled urban activism from the streets into institutionalized and professionalized agencies. By showing the contentious negotiations between nonprofit activists, state officials, and foundation officers regarding the nature of Latino political mobilizations, Carey's Political argues that nonprofits are a powerful vehicle in the remaking of contemporary racial subjectivities and citizenship. As critical community-based organizations, they negotiate how urban racial subjects relate to the state and social movements. I demonstrate how these institutions animate politics of race, 
produce spaces, and build communities of resistance. For today's presentation, I want to share a chapter of the book manuscript. The title of the talk is Geographies of Activism, Cartographic Memory, and Community Practices of Care. So, in order to think about the making of Latino nonprofits, we must first create a more expansive register of 1960s social movements. The Chicano movement, like Black Panther mobilizations, is primarily conceptualized as a radical uprising spearheaded by a new generation of youth who revolted against the previous moderate or reformist against previous moderate or reformist political postures. The activists I interviewed, however, represented a wide spectrum of mobilizing strategies that were not this led me to conclude that labels such as radical and moderate or slash conservative obscure the complexities of movements and the social actors that participate in them. Chicano historiography, however, privileges the rise of 1960s and 1970s youth mobilizations eclipsing all previous histories of activism. This episodic conceptualization of Chicano history overtly emphasizes activism as a temporal process with different stages that replace one another, as opposed to employing a place-based analysis that is attentive to the different modes of political ideologies within a particular space-time. Chicano movement historian Maylee Blackwell calls this a politics of periodization that has created a male-dominated narrative of the movement. In addition, episodic analyses privilege moments of protest and insurrection that overshadow the grounded practices in which the movement transformed urban landscapes and affected how people experience space. Following Chicana feminist interventions, I contend that this movement represented an expansive bandwidth of varying approaches to achieving community change. I conceptualize the Chicano movement as a contested site of politics for community care. I use the optic of care to analyze how spaces of protest reconstituted themselves from the streets into institutionalized formations such as the classroom and Chicano nonprofit organizations. Now the Bay Area was a major episode center of these types of mobilizations as social movement actors created a plethora of community-based organizations. Yet in Fruitville, which is now comprised primarily of recently arrived immigrants with limited historical knowledge of the neighborhood, little is known about the, uh, the history of the Chicano movement created um, these community-based institutions. Furthermore, the mem memorialization of Oakland as the premier site of black protest has produced a historical amnesia about the city's Chicano-Latino mobilizations. We know little about how Mexican Americans historically mobilized in the city or where they had predominantly lived. Given this context, for today's presentation, I want to think about a central research question. How do we measure the impacts of social movement struggles? To answer this question, I relied on 10 oral histories and drew from a larger project that included 50 in-depth interview <coughs> ethnographic research in Fruitville for over two years, and extensive archival research. And I, I'm happy to talk about the different archives that I visited as well at, at the end. Um, so based on this research, I argue that the work of remembering 1960s activism is a cartographic process that draws attention to the social movement production of space. My concept of cartographic memory is a practice deployed by activists and an analytic to interpret how and why they define their activities through the invocation and graphing of space. Chicano movement activists viewed their work through productions of space and they advanced these projects toward particular claims to power. Historians of cartography have linked map making and power in their critiques of the way in which maps have uh, are typically conceptualized as objective representations of space. Eschewing the presumed objectivity of maps, this body of literature has demonstrated the centrality of map making in statecraft in the accumulation and reification of state and imperial power. As Mishana Goldman elaborates, quote, the development of the scientific modern map, one of the geometric abstract grids, 
is a development that, could, uh, that coincides directly in Europe's war on indigenous people, end quote. Goldman's powerful text entitled Mark My Words suggests that native writers take part in inno important and innovative ways of contesting settler mappings that erased indigenous spatialities. Her study centers indigenous strategies to do what she calls remapping of native space, which according to Goldman, quote, challenge the seemingly objective and transparent forms of Western mapping by including narrative experiences and cultural systems that tell, tell and map a story of survivance and future, end quote. I borrow Goldman's insistence that map can also, maps can also be used as a powerful tool to tell alternative histories and futures. I fuse critical cartography with maybe Blackwell's 2011 analytic of retrofitted memory. As Blackwell demonstrates, retrofitted memory recenters fragments of histories that have been silenced by myopic practices of organizing historical knowledge to provide more nuanced and robust interpretations of movement activism. In what follows, I analyze how activists deployed cartography as a spatial technology to retrofit their memories of the Chicano movement. So let me begin by showing you what I mean by cartographic memory. Put simply, activist memories created complex mappings of the organizations and new community spaces their work helped to construct. As 1970s activist and now educator Annette Oropesa told me, quote, you know, the focal point was, um, was Fruitville on East 14th. There was Street Academy on that corner. If you go south from there in Fruitville, there was the original Centro Legal. Right next to Centro Legal was a taller gráfico that Malachias Montoya ran. If you crossed the street on Fruitville, crossed East 14th, and started going towards the hills, on that side of the street, there was the Barrio Youth Center. Oropesa's memory mapped how residents and activists experienced the neighborhood and shows how organizations were spatially embodied. These agencies, which included youth centers, so arts collectives... Find anything called organization. I'm sorry, Siri. <laughs> <laughs> They're watching us, y'all. <laughs> um, these activists know about being watched, so... Um, Oropesa's memory map... Um, so, the agencies, which included youth centers, arts collectives, and legal services, were clustered in the center of the neighborhood's major traffic ways. Oropesa asserts that this network of organizations structured residents' interactions with one another and their relationships with the social movements of the time. Her cartographic memory reminds us that actors' day-to-day -day experience of the movement took on an urban form, which informed how activists remembered the past. Other activist memories advance an argument that was temporal in scope. Alfredo Cruz, for example, told me about the construction of community parks he had been involved with. He said, quote, At the end of my block, there was a creek in an elderly woman's property, and she couldn't control the weeds. We converted that space into Foothill Park, and it still exists today, except that now its name is Cesar Chavez Park. There was also an annex to the park that came about later, a playground for kids across the street between 38th and 39th Avenues. Cruz's recollections of movement activities were cartographic claims to the production of space. He did not talk about an abstract park, instead remembering its location and the process by which activists had labored to bring material changes to the neighborhood. He described how the park had changed over time, acquiring new sections and even a new name. According to ge geographer Doreen Massey, Current Western type maps give the impression that, quote, space is a surface that is a sphere of complete horizontality, end quote. In contrast, according to Massey, space, quote, presents us with a heterogeneity of practices and processes, and it is an ongoing product of interconnections, meaning that it will always be unfinished and open. Bruce's mapping was an examination of the present and the past, including how the park formation was an ongoing process that, and that the social movement that helped, that shaped it was unfinished and therefore not a historical artifact. He continued to participate in different neighborhood improvement projects 
and he lived in and owned rental properties in the community. Efforts of the Chicano movement, he asserted, still had traction in the neighborhood. Activist cartographic memories also demonstrated the cohabitation of multiple, often contradictory political postures. Elizabeth Liz Mesa, for example, began our conversation by handing me a neighborhood map that she herself had drafted. And this was like the aha moment for a lot of my thinking. Um, so I show up and this is her map, right? And you can see how simple it is, but it's so profoundly sort of generative of different things. Um, so it was a simple sketch of one of the central intersections that activists had previously discussed, um, Fruville Avenue and East 14th, which is now called International Boulevard. And as you can see, the map is not to scale. It showed only a few streets and only detailed some organizations. Yet despite the imprecision of a Mesa's map, it made important arguments. It demonstrated the cohabitation and therefore the mutual constitution of various types of organizations. Mesa later classified some of these as quote-unquote conservative and others as more radical. She was a self-proclaimed radical whose organization, who organized many protests and developed the news agency Comejas. So that's Comejas right there. Which collected and distributed radical news from all over Latin America. Comejas offices were located at the famed intersection of Fruitvale and East 14th and also served as a meeting place for radical activists. Mesa's cartography principally referred to defunct organizations to make claim about the powerful work they had performed. Unlike conservative organizations that received state and philanthropic funding and continued to operate, she said most radical organizations had disappeared. As she told me, quote, nonprofits were more conservative and I think they had to be. They got money from grants. They were smart enough to sustain themselves and to grow and have a positive effect in the community, while we, the radical groups, just disappeared." End quote. As many of the radical leaders went into obscurity, so did the valorization of the organizations they once developed. Let's revisit Mesa's map. Through her narrative process, she retold her passionate involvement with Comejas, which summoned up other radical activists, connections to socialist struggles, and radical news from Latin America and beyond. Mesa lamented that more radical organizations had dissolved primarily due to activist burnout and lack of funding. Moreover, as she detailed, many of these self-proclaimed radical organizations became the targets of police and FBI infiltration. Her recollections were political and selective cartographic memories that gave meaning to those fleeting landscapes of past radical organizations. The political nature of her memories rested on bringing to life the organization that she helped run for years and that she lamented no one really recalled. By recentering this organization and literally drawing it on a map and therefore locating it in the neighborhood, she pulled herself and others out of obscurity. So, returning to her map, this is my rendition of Google Map of her map, right? And, mm -hmm. and again, it's, it's again these very famed intersection, right? And you can just see the proximity of different organizations. Some organizations were, were like the radical ones, and others were like the conservative ones, but just the very location of them in the neighborhood meant that they were, ra they were um, mutually constituted and always sort of interacting with one another. Leaders of what Serrano referred to as conservative nonprofit organizations similarly deployed space to give power to the work that they had done. In my interviews with these lead those leaders, I noticed how they, like radicals, deployed cartographic memories to highlight their, their work. Herman Gallegos was one of the founders of the National Council of La Raza, and Herman Gallegos was also really deeply involved in just about every Chicano nonprofit formation here in the Bay Area. And so he eloquently recalled the material legacies left behind by nonprofits and what he deemed to be non-militant forms of organizations. As he said, quote, you can go to the barrios where we organize throughout California. East San Jose is a good example of where we have no street lights, no stop signs, the creek would overflow, 
Today, the streets are paved. There are sidewalks. There are street lights. There are soccer fields, youth agencies, Head Start programming. You can physically see the changes. I'm not saying that there are no problems, but you can go to those bar other barrios and there are physical changes. For Gallegos, these material legacies show the appropriateness of non-militant forms of activism. As his mapping argued, the fact that you could walk through a neighborhood and point to specific services, buildings, and other infrastructural changes offered proof of the effectiveness of this mode of activism. By linking these nonprofit mediated improvements to a long tradition of Mexican-American organizing, he highlighted the social movement production of space. And finally, in contrast to this, Gallegos asked, quote, what was left behind by militant activism, end quote. Now just to recap, activist recollections of the Chicano movement were principally a map-making process that underscored how their activism changed the urban landscape. The fact that their memories operated in cartographic form brought into focus the day-to-day -day experience of organizing. Ultimately, their spatial technologies of remembering rendered visible their politicized contribution to community formation. So I want to now turn to another, activ uh, another aspect of activist memories. How social movement activism made Fruitville a symbol of Mexican-American identity. Fruitville did not, um, not always symbolize Mexicanidad or Latino identity. It had historically been an Italian and Portuguese community and began to change at the height of, of um, World War II fueled industrialization and post-war movement of ethnic whites into more suburban areas of the East Bay. According to activists I spoke with, the creation of Fruitville as a Mexican-American place with a shared politicized identity occurred primarily through social movement organizing. Now the mandate of Chicano community improvement just started already pre-existing neighborhood organizing endeavors. Since the late 1950s, a progressive pastor, Father Lynch, helped to organize neighborhood residents to forge a united voice for Mexican Americans in Oakland. Furthermore, groups such as the Community Service Organization, CSO, developed lo local neighborhood politicizing, politicization projects. These neighborhood organizing hubs, comp comprised mainly of parents and an older generation of leaders, helped to guide 1960s and 1970s projects. As Dr. Hayes Bautista, one of the initial founders of Clinica, Fruitvale's Clinica de la Raza, he recalled, quote, I got a phone call one night from one of the moms who I was working with. She said that the parents group could not depend on the county, so they needed to develop their own health center. Then of course she started telling me, we don't know anything about it, so we want you to direct us. So I said, Eleanor, I haven't even started medical school yet, end quote. Um, Dr. Hayes Bautista's recollections demonstrate relationships of collaboration between politicized Chicano youth and an older Mexican-American generation. There was a specific gender component to this work as mothers who organized to improve community resources spearheaded many of the neighborhood level forms of organizing. Um, and many of these initial organizing hubs occurred at members' homes and grew into more, as they grew into more institutionalized projects. Regina Chavarin also remembered the formation of the community's first Chicano health and legal clinic. She said, quote, when El Centro de Garden La Clinica's first site was identified, it used to be an old restaurant and bakery. We went there and cleaned it up. I put a crew together which consisted mostly of women, my brothers, sisters, and students. Again, this work proved to be an, a multi-generational project that enlisted the help of all sectors of the community. And Regina also tells me in, in my oral history with her that they did a community needs assessment in which they, they went to and asked the entire community what it is that they wanted these centers to be like. Um, as many of the activists revealed, the cultivation of a community identity took on a spatial form. Within a span of a couple of years, a number of different brick and mortar service organizations came to exist. Residents could now avail themselves of free health and legal services that were delivered in a culturally relevant fashion. These new institutions helped to consolidate the, um, neighbor, uh, the neighborhood's identity as Latino. 
Fruitvale's Community Development Corporation, the Unity Council, for example, interpreted its redevelopment projects as creating a new image of Mexican Americans through productions of space. It believed its projects directly impacted how Chicanos were perceived as a group and how Fruitvale was projected as a neighborhood. In 1973, it completed its first redevelopment project, 61 units of family housing called Las Casitas. As Abadera Martinez, the Unity Council's executive director, recalled, quote, when we had our open house for Las Casitas, there were a lot of people and the community was really excited because, I mean, Mexicans built this. And admittedly, this is not a picture of Las Casitas, but it's another redevelopment project that the Unity Council did. It still exists, but I just wanted to show you just what it meant to have a space built by Mexican Americans in, in the 60s and early 70s. Um, by 1976, the Unity Council had three housing projects, two completed and one in progress. Its crowning glory was the construction of the agency's headquarters, which had marketed as a community resource center. It was actually also the house, um, it also housed the, the, the community's first Latin American library, which was an important um, uh, center for, uh, for most of the people I talked to. As urban planner, planner Ramon Gutierrez uh, recalls, quote, we were in our own sweet brand new site that everyone knew as the Spanish-speaking Unity Council building. Though the Unity Council headquarters is only three stories high and not huge, it was built from the ground up. And in those days, everything had to be Mexican. You had to hire a Mexican architect, a Mexican planner, end quote. Therefore, the new Unity Council building was seen not just as any kind of redevelopment project, it was understood as a Mexican-American project and an architectural symbol of the community's racial identity and the group's ability to succeed. This is the uh, picture of the, the Unity Council um, um, offices. Um, and the Unity Council is also the, the organization that built the Fruitville Transit Village. So if you've ever been through Fruitville, or the Unity Council built that. And that's another chapter of the, of the book. Um, as Henri Lefebvre argued, the capitalist production of space enacts, quote, a logic of homogeneity and a strategy of the repetitive, end quote, with the ultimate goal of reproducing the social relations of production. Unity Council development projects, however, disrupted this homogeneity by branding their projects as Mexican and Mexican-American. This production of racial space was a highly political act. As Doreen Massey argues, quote, the identities of place are always unfixed, contested, and multiple, which therefore means that any attempts to stabilize the meaning of a particular place involves a social contest, battles over the power to label space-time, to impose the meaning to be attributed to a space." End quote. In sum summary, as activists detailed, social movement activism helped to produce Fruitvale as a Latino neighborhood. It also solidified a politicized dedication to the care and protection of the neighborhood and its residents. This spatially defined politicization deepened neighborhood level interrelationships. Activists participated in what they refer to as a boot camp of sorts, through which they developed enduring social net networks. And Regina's husband, Roger, actually quoted, um, came up with this idea of boot camp. Um, they further explained that these dense networks of activism constituted long-term friendships, partnerships, and even romantic ties. The ideas of comadrasco and compadrasco describe these types of political kinship networks which revolved around community protection and care. Activists argued that they sustained these social relations um, that, and, and, and the and, and these social relations interact, uh, influence how they interacted with the neighborhood in the following decades. Roger Echeverria, for example, recalled, quote, everyone came to boot camp together and the next generation is in line and there's going to be better services because you won't have to deal with the racism and alienation. You were literally neighbors and you were connected, end quote. Um, in Chavarins, I'm sorry, I, 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 this is one of the things, the errors in when you do academic work, I accidentally called um, Chavarin. I, 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 in my article, I use Echeverria by accident, and it stuck with me, so I'm sorry. Echeverria means Chavarin, 
I apologize. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Regina. <laughs> um, so in Chavarin's view, the Chicano movement built services for the future generation through the collaborative work of different uh, institutions. This occurred through a shared politicized mission of community improvement. These social networks consolidated future um, opportunities. Roger's wife, Regina Chavarin, for example, went on to direct a nonprofit uh, called Narc Narcotics Education League, or NEL. As NEL's executive director, she relied on the networks she built through her movement activism. As she explained, quote, help was a phone call away, a handshake away. It was really easy. That was one of the things that I noticed about my years working at NEL. I always kept my connection with everybody. I could walk into county agencies or other nonprofits and get help because I had either worked or done volunteer work or sat on a committee with, uh, with these people. It was like going to see your comadres, your compa compadres, end quote. Central to Regina Chavarin's explanation of the importance of these social networks was their longevity. Though the moments of street protests were now in the past, the social relations built through the mobilizations endured. And these lasting relationships represented a set of opportunities they enabled contemporary forms of mobilizations. Community care projects also formed youth development programs that, operate, that opened new opportunities and resources. This included educational and job training projects that helped to create future generations of leaders. Manuel Alcalá was then a youth and recalled how inspired he was to see the workings of, the, uh, of, of this kind of um, Chicano organizing. He said, quote, so I walked into the Unity Council offices and I looked around and there was a lot of Chicano art on the walls. I said, wow, this is great, this is wonderful. I felt like I was at home because there was no place else that reflected our culture, end quote. As he and other people I interviewed recalled of this period, they all held dear um, memories of the tremendous cultural work of the Unity Council and other affiliated nonprofits um, that they did in this period. Manuel Alcalá recalled how one summer Aravela Martinez, quote, called all the Latinos, all the Chicanos, all the Mexicanos to work for the summer program. He worked as a newspaper delivery boy and a photographer at UC Berkeley events. He participated in educational retreats where youth learned about Chicano culture and also networked with other neighborhood residents. These types of programs, as Manuel Alcalá described, were instrumental to tracking students into achieving university education, as well as preparing them for professional jobs in the nonprofit or private sector. These programs also instilled in them a sense of pride about their culture that resonated with the cultural tendencies of the Chicano movement. A, geography, a geographer, Doreen Massey, and I keep on coming back to Doreen Massey, she's like my goddess, the <laughs> geographer goddess, and she has multiple Bibles that she's written. I would highly, highly recommend them all. Um, so she reminds us, quote, what gives place its specificity is not some long internalized history, but the fact that it is constructed out of a particular constellation of social relations, meeting and weaving together at a particular locus, end quote. Now to summarize, social bonds and forms of sociality developed in the 1960s and 1970s were kept alive through the relationships activists built with one another. These relationships helped to continually produce Fruitvale as an incubator of social movement struggles. These bonds, including some romantic relationships and experimental practices of organizing and working together did not end. They continued and helped them build new partnerships in the years that ensued. It is not surprising that today, Oakland's Fruitville District has the highest concentration of social services and, a political, um, and political action projects designed for Latinos. It is also the epicenter of Oakland's immigrant rights activism. Um, returning to the initial question that animated this talk, how do we measure the impacts of social movement struggles? I think we as scholars can learn much from Chicano movement activists' cartographic memories. As I have detailed, cartographic memory is not just an act of remembering. It is a political remaking of urban geography and therefore a selective mapping to emphasize the contributions of certain groups while rendering others less visible. 
Activist cartographic memories reveal the political nature of placemaking and the centrality of space in negotiations of power. Collectively, activist um, recollections made an important argument that was, has a, also a temporal dimension. Through their deployment of cartographic memories, they challenge conceptions of the, de the movement's declining significance. Activists marshaled improvements made in urban neighborhoods such as parks, urban farms, health clinics, and legal centers to single the lasting impacts of their movement activism. These changes continue to affect neighborhood politics and access to opportunities. Ultimately, these activists argued that we as scholars must stop thinking of the Chicano movement as a historical artifact and instead construct a more accurate assessment of its long-lasting traction and impacts. In conclusion, I think my analysis of Chicago movement activism has important implications for how we fight the current authoritarian regime. For me, this is both about how we study social movements and how we learn from history and the historical struggles of people of color and other oppressed groups. Regarding how we study and support social movements, certain political pundits like the New York Times op-ed columnist David Brooks um, were quick to undermine the importance of the anti-Trump ma marches and critiqued how the demonstrations mobilized gender and racial identities. I would urge us to think of the marches as a manifestation of a broader and more expansive mobilization of people that, like the Chicano movement actors that I just spoke about, will take an array of different approaches to resist this regime. I know that the organizations that I spoke about today are already mobilizing in defense of vulnerable populations. We need to build a robust accounting of the range of geographies of activism being carved out on a daily basis that intersect with and are informed by the traces of social movements of the past. However, in light of what I see as a diverse, multidimensional tide of organizing, I am skeptical for calls of, of quote-unquote national unity or attempt to erase our differences. Within the first weeks of the new regime, we've already been presented with its obsession with building a wall, a ban on Muslim migration, and sanctions against sanctuary cities. This, to me, exemplifies the inseparability of race from the productions of the, for the production of space and is a reminder of the importance of geography in constructions of difference. This is where we, as critical scholars, can play an integral role both in analyzing geographies of resistance and in supporting the very counter spaces popping up everywhere. In order to do so, I think we need to think more critically about forms of difference such as race, sexuality, and gender as constitutive of the production of space, not just as outliers or epiphenomena. The regime's hate tactics, its right-wing right rhetoric, and obsessions with U.S. exceptionalism is not new. Indigenous groups, people of color, women, and sexual minorities have waged uphill battles against these forms of oppression since the founding of this country. As Angela Davis so eloquently reminded us in her speech at the Women's March, quote, the history of this country is anchored in slavery and settler colonialism, end quote. As a result of the violent foundations of this country, its history has also been fundamentally shaped by resistance. Now more than ever, we need to learn from this history of resistance and social movement activism because as Audre Lorde famously wrote, quote, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house, end quote. Thank you. Oh, this was, I was supposed to show this. <laughs> and then the final one. <sighs> so thank you all for being here. Uh -huh. And I'm, I'm just, before opening up for questions, I wanted to give the floor to, um, to three of the activists that are here from Fruitville, um, um, two of which I've already um, talked to, but I wanted to um, give them the floor if they wanted to share maybe personal reflections briefly. Um, it's up to you. But um, did I do it justice? <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down, yes? Yeah. yeah. Anything you want to add? Do you want to share what you're up to now? It, it's, it's interesting just um, reflect on the whole Oh, 
<laughs> Annette, do you want to come up here because they're videotaping and so... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, it, it's really interesting reflecting, uh, you know, what was going on back then when you put that up. I really considered myself back in the time um, a worker bee for a lot of what was going on in the communities. I worked at, at Gomejas for a while. I worked at the, the Barrio Youth Center and at the uh, Citizens Foundation. I worked at the Unity Council. So again, just to show all those connections that were going on, and I see another one of our, uh, from back in the day, Celia Medero. <laughs> hey, she is another Fruitvale uh, activist mm -hmm. back there, working with the Centro Infantil and uh, La Escuelita. So um, anyway, it just, it just really, uh, got my brain going on a lot of um, the things that you said and how you put that together and I thought it was really, really, um, it, it said it all. Thank you. That, that's what it was. That was going on. Rahina has something else she wants to add to Rahina, that. come join us. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. One of the things I said to Juan um, after I saw, read the book the first time the that, page that you sent me was, oh my goodness, this is a really very interesting because many years later, one of the things I did was, we, and as a result of learning our organizing mm -hmm. techniques, we organized and we had an acre of open space across the street from my house. And it was eight properties at one time. So we organized, we took over the property, we got a nonprofit that was at times, everything was, I was, I was a student here at Berkeley. I worked at Centro Legal. My first work study was actually at Centro Legal, mm -hmm. back in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I got to come here to Cal. And I was just saying a few minutes ago that just a couple of doors down from here is where the Chicano Art Center was, where Malaquias was. So when you're talking about Malaquias over here in the taller, in the fruit bay, I was thinking, this was our taller here mm -hmm. at Cal. <laughs> it's right here. My very first time I came to Cal, that's the first place I went to. Mm -hmm. very wow. first place uh, I went to. So it has a lot of, lot of memories. It's like, wow. Right back here. And back when we pulled up, right, right, I'm going to go, oh, that's what you got to study. It's just to be, right? Ah, the art center. So yeah. spent and to make, many hours there. And to make another connection, though, mm -hmm. a lot of the, the people who created the organizations, like Centro Legal and uh, La Clinica, were Berkeley students. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. of the first Latino Mexicanos that had come to the university mm -hmm. still wanted to yeah. give back to their community. So they went into the community. David Hay Bautista was approached. Joel yeah. Garcia is another person uh, that was approached and helped to create, you know, some of these organizations. So there's a real um, close tie. I worked for a while as a Chicano Studies counselor here at Cal, mm -hmm. and I'm still doing my work in the Fruitvale. And like Rakina said, the culture, the Chicano Cultural Center was right next door, and we had a lot of fundraisers, Mecha, and the community, you know, coming together with the campus uh, Chicanos. To uh, do events, to do uh, radical events. It was mm -hmm. one of the features that I brought to the table was um, when we did the needs assessment and David Hay. Oh, it was a lot of Cal students, mm -hmm. but I was probably the only one in the, from the neighborhood. Mm. Okay, so I got to sit on a lot of committees as the youth representative <laughs> from Cal because, like, they were trying to make a connection, but I was the only one from the neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember, like, wow. But so, of course, my heard that they had openings at Centro Legal from my college roommate. I said, like, I'm going to work there. And I literally grew up on 38th Avenue, and it was on 37th and 38th mm -hmm. Avenue. It was like, okay, I'm going yeah. to go there to work. Yeah. So it was awesome. Um, so there were a lot of connections over the years, and a lot of brainstorming that came out of that. And yes, a lot of the leaders and people who actually became the community leaders and heads of organizations were students from Cal. That was mm -hmm. how we integrated. Yeah. Uh, and just did so much. Yes. What, what, were, what was the kind of range of dates in which that uh, Chicano Center was really active and then doing the outreach toward Fruitville? Um, the, this Chicano Center was already here, okay? So in 1968, uh, around March 68, right, is when the Third World Strike, the original Third World Strike, I've heard there's versions of it here at Cal over the years, the original Third World Strike took place at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley. Okay, I was a junior in high school when that was happening. He was a junior. And, um, well, I guess he was a senior anyway. So that was at that time, okay? So okay. then, when this, as a result of the third world strike, there was a lot of outreach to get more Latinos, African Americans, Asians to Cal. So I got to come to Cal as a result of mm -hmm. that outreach, those were outreach efforts. Mm -hmm. It was just a fluke that I happened to meet a recruiter because everybody was going back out into the community trying to connect. And I was at a birthday party. 
when somebody con was connecting and, and she was like talking to somebody over there and my dad goes, go, go listen, go listen, right? So I went over and, and she was trying to recruit somebody up from my high school. Mm -hmm. But that girl was in the ninth grade and I was a senior. I'm like, how about me? <laughs> so it was, it's, you know what? It's all about timing and space, being at the right place at the right time. Because I was actually supposed to be at my cousin's wedding that day. <laughs> and I was pissed that I didn't get to my cousin's wedding. But I would have missed that opportunity that changed my whole life. Okay? And, and that March, we did, and, uh, having my senior year, uh, we did contemporary education, you know, in, in high school. And you're looking at current events. So we all had to make reports during our current events. And mine was on Cesar Chavez. There wasn't a lot written about Cesar Chavez and United Farm Workers, but that's what I did my topic on. My best friend did the third world strike. So that moment, those few days, just changed my life. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden I was aware, wow, all this stuff's happening out there in the world. Right here, right, right here in my life, in my community. And at that time I didn't even realize it, but right next door to my high school was, um, what was it called? <laughs> I just forgot. Um, the Chicano, the one with, um, no, no, no. What high school? Let's just say it was high school. Casa? No, no, way no. before. Casa. Those came Casa? here years later. I forgot. Casa? He said, I taught at Stanford. No, it was mm. La Causa. La Causa. Uh, La Causa. La Causa. That was way before any of the nonprofits were settled. Okay, my God. So, get back in the video. <laughs> <laughs> well, La Causa was right next door, and they were organizing. My husband tells me, because he would go there, he told me, the profess these guys became professors later at Stanford and stuff. They would, when Chicano Studies first started out here, there were no resources or books. It was hard to find materials. So they would get all those materials and students would go to La Casa, get these books, and then they'll take them to campus so people would have their books. They could find the resources. I mean, there was just a lot of networking. So there was a lot of history right next door at La Casa that happened. And I realize now, well, I wish I would have known this. So I could have connected. It was like right next to me, and I didn't even know it. So, so there's also an info information flow from La Casa to the campus. To the well. campus, yeah. So there was a lot of support that way. Uh -huh. Also to the high schools, because that's how I, I got involved. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. La Causa would go to the high schools, and they would have an, uh, uh, they got permission to get an assembly at the end of the last period. Anybody uh, interested in going to college? Mm -hmm. well, you know, I wanted to be a teacher. So I was a kid, right? Mm -hmm. So I told her, I want to go. I'm trying to do everything myself and my counselor gave me the wrong classes. And I, it was just a nightmare. Mm -hmm. uh, shorthand one, shorthand two, typing one, typing two. I said, I don't want to be a secretary. I want to be a teacher. <laughs> right, right. But, but you do do a lot of that as a teacher. But they <laughs> would go, and then they have that meeting. And then they have a follow-up meeting after school. So that Laura, everybody would was, get out to the But then there was a smaller group. And then... They start telling you, your counselor should be doing this with you. They're supposed to give you this information. They have to get waivers mm -hmm. to, to the, you know, the, the tests, the exams, to both. And I ended up with uh, three scholarships, Mills, Berkeley, and Stanford. But Mills gave me a full scholarship. Mm -hmm. So I was one of the first Chicanas that went to Mills. Mm -hmm. But that, that they did yeah. a lot. And there were a lot of students that worked at Lake House, yeah. and that's the kind of things they did. You want to know. And I remember when you graduated from Mills, you didn't wear the cap and gown. You no, wore a, a, a poncho. I wore a huelga. A huelga yeah. uh, UFW Supposed poncho, to be the three of right? us, but the other two didn't. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to be. I was just about to be bounced. So. Right. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, so they're just going to say one last thing and then we're going to open it up for Q&A. So. Um, you know, things do come full circle and, and a lot of us, uh, we call ourselves veteranos of the, of the movement, had got together about uh, two, three years ago and we started uh, talking about how we didn't document those times. And so we said, while well, we're still around, it's not too late. So we started the Fruitvale History Project, and we started doing interviews from people from back in the day, uh, Hina and Celia and Huel and some of the people that, um, you know, helped to form these organizations. And we have about, oh, 15, 16 interviews now, and, um, you know, we've done a, a, a collage of the documentaries for the Latin American Library and Fruitvale, and we're planning on doing some other things just to bring it back into the community because as um, Juan Herrera found out, you know, a lot of the, the people who live there now don't have that memory of what mm -hmm. came before. They yeah. take for granted, and I think that's a beautiful thing they can take for granted, that La Clinica is there and Centro mm -hmm. Legal is there, but, you know, to know your beginnings is important too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Also <laughs> Just one thing. I think Regina mentioned it's life changing mm -hmm. because once 
you're able to see a lot clearer the, the larger picture yeah. and know where you're at in that larger picture. You know, you start saying, what's wrong with me? Why I, this, why that, why that? Really empowers you and, and you can't forget that. So even like the, the last march with the women's march or the other march, you know, it, it's me, you know, my daughter and my grandmother, all the generations because yeah. it impacts not just me. It's going to impact the generations all right. after me. So that's yeah. what's really important. So once you change your mind, you can't just turn your back on injustice. You really can't. Yeah. Right. It is your life. It is the decisions you make. It's right. how you view your world. It's your, it, it, you reflect yourself in that mirror. If you don't see yourself struggling, you know, it, it's, it doesn't do well with your heart. Right. So it, that's, it's important. That's why that kind of work that comes about with students and, and other people and community work is so important. That unity is also so important. And this is the time. Yeah. This is, I, I feel, feel really bad for all the young people. Worrying up with a lot of things like you know five steps forward and then and pushing you back. Yeah. Right? So we, we've got to yeah. really stand together. Thank you for that. Important. Move yes. Thank you. Well, um, I want to say one thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to open up for <laughs> questions. Lisa, I, I brought up the thing about the land trust. Um, and then another event later, we did some work around the alcohol um, coalition for alcohol outlets. So we. Um, so we took over our neighborhood space and we took it over, which is great. We ran it for 20 years and it's a, it was a nonprofit, and then we dissolved it when we completed our task, which was to protect this open space in the neighborhood from ever being developed. And then another time we worked on another effort and it was about, we had over 400 liquor stores in our neighborhood. Okay, So we did a whole thing around trying to create, uh, and it was about space, the whole thing ties back to this topic of space and that's what came back to me. So we at some point started challenging us and going to the city and going to a, a um, alcohol beverage outlet and said, wait, we want more control of what's going on in our neighborhood. These liquor stores are here. But how they behave, it all impacts our community. Because back in the day, they were selling single beers, single alcohol. They were selling single cigarettes. And people were loitering and hanging in front of streets. So we went and we battled on that for many, for many, in many ways. and. The uh, Safeway stores and the big stores that carry liquor and the bars and the liquor stores got together and we ended up having a lawsuit. Mm -hmm. And we went to the Ninth Circuit Court. So the other day when they, we had the hearing at the Ninth Circuit the Court, it just brought it back. That's what he and I were talking about. Oh my God, this is great. We won. We, the community, won. We had a right to say how space was used in our neighborhood. Okay, so they banned and they started putting up the signs for against loitering, no more single cigarettes, no more selling beer on ice in the store so that you just take out your bottle and go outside and drink. We changed that. So I share that with you because there's so much we can do. And we do have a right to say how our community is used. And the fact that we won that case in the Ninth Circuit Court was just awesome. It brought that. So what happened recently, you know, about the ban and all that just brought back those memories. So yeah. there's, there's many ways that we can find you to, to share that. <laughs> possibilities. Thank you. Thank you so much. So questions, comments, concerns? Yes. Uh, well, that, that comment ties to a question that I have. Um, I really like your point about they weren't just apolitical service providers. And then you talked also a little bit about some of the tensions or, you know, just the spectrum of different organizations and kind of the tensions between being political but also getting funding. Mm -hmm. and so I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit more about that. And, um, yeah. Really yeah. So, um, actually, a lot of the book looks predominantly at the Unity Council, mm -hmm. um, which is the main nonprofit in um, in Fruitvale. It's like the largest Latino nonprofit. And this is the, what's interesting is that I found archival sources for the Unity. It's also like a story about how we conceptualize the archive and how we do our research, right? And so, um, a lot of my early research was archival, and so the, the Unity Council factor prominently. Um, and it wasn't until I started meeting these activists that the oral histories came to give a different, a broader picture, right? Mm -hmm. But um, regarding um, the sort of dynamic of funding, um, I look at how the Unity Council was initially funded by the, the, the Southwest Council of La Raza, which is now the National Council of La Raza, which was funded by the Ford Foundation. Mm -hmm. So I look at the relationship between the Ford Foundation and this funding agency that becomes a sub-grantee money uh, organization, so it gets Ford money and sub-grants mm -hmm. to smaller agencies mm -hmm. to funnel money into nonprofits, um, Latino nonprofits. Mm -hmm. But then there's um, there's this conflict around the Ford Foundation. 
funding um, the National Council of Alasa and uh, allegations that some of these organizations that were funded were radical organizations and, um, and um, spewing hatred against whites in the US. And so there's this <coughs> congressional reform, congressional appeal about for foundation funding of Mexican American organizations that leads to what's called the 1969 Tax Reform Act, which specifically stipulates that nonprofits cannot do political work. So it says it's a non it's a non political clause that nonprofits cannot be involved in political processes, but it, it really specifies electoral processes. But I look at how this really becomes this depoliticization clause, right? Because many nonprofit leaders feared what it really meant. Um, so, despite the fact that it was very limited to electoral processes, it just rendered all politics suspect. And so, I look at that dynamic, and again, it's this this scalar analysis of the Ford Foundation, Congress, the National Council of Raza, the Unity Council, Oakland, but all this intersecting and really impacting the very nature of what nonprofits can do in the neighborhood and what they can't. Um, so that's sort of a, I don't know if I completely answered, but it's, yeah, it's still forthcoming. It's <laughs> yes, it's great. It, it's really great, and it's great to see you present all this work that I've had Thank the privilege you. of seeing from years back. But this, Deborah's question actually um, makes me think of this, which is in contemporary kind of prison reform movements, you see some of the more radically positioned organizations um, who have a certain, a deeper political integrity perhaps to more radical reforms, mm -hmm. pushing some of the more conservative organizations yeah. along, right? Yeah. And that also means that in some ways those more conservative organizations own credibility rests mm -hmm. on a conversation with those Absolutely. more radically positioned yes. ones. And you talked about this kind of interweaving, the physicality of yeah. how the organi organizations are really in communication with each other. And I wonder if you see some sort of effect, even with the kind of the nonprofit depoliticization of financial structures yeah. within the community itself. This kind of accountability to a more radical positioning, yeah. as they're also in such close proximity. Right. I, I just wonder because it's interesting in thinking about that legacy for today's yeah. world. Yeah. No, I think absolutely. There's um, there's an ongoing negotiation that happens, and the way I try, I'm trying to talk about this is. Um, in one of the, the last chapters, I'm talking about what I'm calling um, mentorship relationships mm -hmm. between some of these old established organizations. Mm -hmm. So my, my main case point is Clinica de la Raza, for example, which as Regina talked about, it was, it, was in, it was started in an old restaurant, right? All volunteer staff. It's now a multi-million dollar federally funded agency that has 23 different sites throughout the, the East Bay. Um, and it's also a really difficult agency to get service at, especially if you're an undocumented worker. So I, this one last chapter looks at the formation of uh, an organization called Street Level Health Project that works with access, uh, giving access to um, health care for undocumented day laborers and how they work with Clinica de la Raza to help to expedite the process by which um, patients get seen at Clinica. So it's basically a chapter that's looking at these dynamic relationships between what I'm calling startup nonprofits that are, tend to be much more politicized and much more like they're newer and, and can are, and rely on less of these funding streams and therefore can do different things and how they push against some of the limitations that have happened because of institutionalization. Um, so yeah, so th there, there is a, a very dynamic interrelationship in the, in the contemporary setting that I think has a precedent from historically, yeah. So the last comment now when you were talking about going into the archive reminded me of uh, Christina Morrow's work, especially um, thinking about how organizations, nonprofits started to frame themselves not as a particular ethnicity, Mexican-American, Mexican but more Latino to get more uh, money yeah. or funding from different organizations. Mm -hmm. So, but your work stands out more as like on the ground kind of place making. So I'm just yeah. wondering how you position your work or the place making in relation in relation to the construction of Latinidad with Mora or Lindavida's work. Yeah, on. yeah. So I definitely Cristina Mora is a huge I was I referenced her. I read her dissertation while doing this and she's a tremendous friend and help uh, she's helped me along a lot. Um, but what I think I 
I think there are limitations to some of that archival approach, right? And um, because they don't tell the full story, and, and speci specifically, they don't tell like a grounded story about what, how this impact, these processes impacted neighborhoods, right? And so for me, it's been having to think about what do I consider my archive, right? And and yes, I, Stanford has a lot of amazing archives that deal with these nonprofits and the National Council of Alabasta and everything, and so they were really central, but. I then started thinking about urban spaces archive, right? So I, um, I think about how spatial formations or, or changes in the urban form also tell us a lot about these broader political processes, right? And, and so instead of telling the story of Latino panethnicity that, that, that Cristina Mora tells, I'm very much thinking about just like the, because if you look at space, there are multiple ways in which people identify, right? So I try to give, um, give justice to the multiplicity of different ways that people identify and throughout. So what's interesting is that at this, in some of these historical moments, people were calling themselves Chicanos. They were also calling themselves Mexican-American, Spanish-speaking. Um, and also the Chicano word was not limited to just radical organizations. There were some really conservative ones that used Chicano. Um, so I try to sort of paint the, the multiplicity of different identity labels that people utilize, but how they were all sort of constructed around a politicized mission of caring for the broader Latino population and caring for a neighborhood as well. I don't know if I completely answered your question, but yeah. Yes? And then Ryan. there's the, the idea of the archival today of welcoming people from all over the world right. who come every year anew. Yeah. And so I was thinking, as you were presenting, you know, to reclaim the history of the Latino movement and, and the Chicano movement in Fruitvale and make it more visible as the signage you have mm -hmm. on the screen does and so on. And then how to weave that into really, really welcoming. Yeah. Uh, other very disadvantaged groups uh, who are there today come. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we faced that at, at Peralta and Hacienda um, because it is a site with a colonial history that is, you can't really paint with broad brush because it's oh. really complicated. Um, and then we've done a lot of exhibits about other uh, immigrant groups and right. fail. But last year we had 20 events, uh, thanks to some funding, uh, about Latino history and culture, and it was uh, tremendously a huge response. Right, right, right. I mean, I was thinking as you were talking, it'd be really great to have this this talk in Fruitvale. Yeah. Maybe a little more poppy <coughs> yeah. uh, in language, <laughs> but it would be. Really I can work on that. Yeah, I would. I would love. I, I think once the book comes, I want to have a book party in Fruitvale. Yeah. 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 When would <laughs> um, that be? Um, <laughs> it's, it's. It's. I'm on a path, but I don't know how soon. Um, but talk about welcoming other cultures. Yeah. No. A absolutely. And I think um, because I extensively work on the Unity Council, the, the Unity Council is now called mainly the Unity Council. It was originally the Spanish-speaking Unity Council, but now it's, it's opened itself up to be now just the Unity Council because of that. Because the Fruitvale is changing so much that it's now a really diverse neighborhood. And, but what's in, what I think is important is that despite the diversity of Fruitvale, the demographic diversity, it still brands itself as a Latino neighborhood. Which I think is because of the social movement activism. Mm -hmm. right? Um, because yes, I think... Latinos might still be 50%, but I'll, there's a lot more diversity, right? And so um, I think that it's part of what's going to be happening. There's going to be constant contestations to how we label space, right? And, and I think it is, as it's becoming a lot more diverse, it's, there's already sort of movements to try to, to, to sort of represent that um, and to think about the multiple histories that are now shaping um, Fruitvale, and even in the name of the Unity Council, we can see it already sort of a mission to that. Um, but even like Latino populations have changed a lot since the 60s to now, right? Um, so most of the folks here were 
um, were like second generation Mexican Americans, um, some immigrants, but now it's like predominantly immigrant in that neighborhood, predominantly Central American as well as the new migrants, right? So it's this very complicated sort of diversity of everything, and I'm sure it's going to be branded as something new soon. Um, um, yeah. I'm sorry. And I went to OUSD, big meeting, and they said that other districts in East Oakland are uh, much more heavily Latino than mm -hmm. Fairfield now, mm -hmm. which is interesting. I mean, it's still over 50% in Fairfield, yeah. but it's even more, and I had no idea. There was this huge map, and stretching into East Oakland was more and more Latino. Right, right. Oh, like absolutely. Much more than African American, which yeah. was really surprised me. Mm -hmm. Um, so then, uh, thank you so much. This was so interesting, and I've done some of my work in fruit too, yeah. so it was great to learn more about the history of thank it. You. Um, so I have a question for you, sort of thinking about the future of activism and what the implications of the importance of space and cartographic memory is for recent demographic trends, where there are more immigrants that are moving to the suburbs that are more spread out where there aren't, you know, these foundational nonprofit organizations that have been involved in this activism. And so how can we sort of start to think about how we can take these space elements into account mm -hmm. um, as we start to forge new strategies for activism, you know, especially now in the Trump era. Mm -hmm. Like, do you, you know, do we need to have concentrated spaces um, and this infrastructure built in space, or how do we start building activism in new space? Yeah, that's a really good question. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a dissertation topic. <laughs> Do you want to write that? <laughs> no, but I think it's really it's it's it's, it's really great. Um, um, it, it it's kind of controversial, you know. Like I'll, when I say that I work on nonprofits and institution building, you know, and I work in very activist spaces. Um, I it's like it raises red flags the work that I do because you know these nonprofits are labeled as part of the nonprofit industrial complex, right? And there are problems to the nonprofit structure. There are ways in which they they are they're implicated in in sort of the taming of social movement politics, right? Um, and so, but I, my my argument is always like. I don't use the language of co-optation because I feel like it's historically and in the contemporary setting, it, it sort of forecloses any conversation about the actual work that happens via nonprofits and institutions, right? So yes, this is a, a part of a, a, a narrative of co-optation and how it happens, right? But people still do work on the ground, right? So I do think that institutions matter, right? But I think that there are different ways of creating institutions that we don't necessarily need to replicate the nonprofit model, right? We don't necessarily need to, I think there are a lot of really great organizations that are doing really innovative work where they're not trying to depend on foundation money, they're not trying to depend on state funding. They're, they're really becoming incredible laboratories of different modes of funding projects, different modes of creating institutions. So I think that as populations, because you're right, most. Um, most people of color nowadays are moving to the suburbs and it's, it's like a, a big move into that more interior part. So I think we, I think institutions do matter and they do create opportunities. I think they're needed, but I think that they're probably going to continue the same nonprofit model, but I think there are organizations that are trying to expand the potential, right, and, and, and using alternative frameworks that might offer even better possibilities. Um, but yeah, I think infrastructure is definitely necessary. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of conversations about there's a lot of conversations about how private philanthropy can help that process, right? Mm -hmm. I've been meeting with a lot of folks that do work on philanthropy, and they're on advisory boards saying, "Okay, big foundations, you need to think about giving fund like uh, it's in the foundation world, it's called like what is it?" Um, it's um, money that's not tied to a particular project. Mm -hmm. I forget the exact Operation. name. Operational. No, not operational, but it's... Operations? No. Unrestricted. Unrestricted, thank you. So there's a movement to be like, okay, foundations, if you want more substantive change, right, mm -hmm. or more sort of powerful change to happen immediately, 
You need to think about these unstructured funds that are not tied to any programmatic endeavor, right? So there are people that are experimenting with these things, right? And I think the Bay Area has a lot of these kinds of experimentations. Um, yeah. But he not. I was going to say, I, part of my experience over the years is at some point the workers in the nonprofits need to step out. When we talk about the Fruitvale History Project and documenting not so much interviewing all the main leaders, okay, but all the people that were on the ground level, okay? So the ground level has to come from within the community, from the workers, because the nonprofit can't tell you to go be political. You want to do it because you want to do it, so you're going to do it outside of your work. When you leave at the end of the day, on the weekends, it's organizing back, going back to your grassroots organizing. That's where it has to come from. Because you can't, they can't tell you what we have to do, it has to come from our hearts, mm -hmm. right? The motivation that yeah. comes from us in the community. Yes, thank you for that. So it looks like we're running out of time. <laughs> I am so grateful to everybody for being here, and um, thank, you. thank you so much. Thank you.